In our last video, we worked on taking a definite integral and writing that definite integral in Riemann sum. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to work backwards. We're going to go ahead and dissect the Riemann sum and then evaluate uh, what definite integral that is, because in most cases, it will be easier to determine that value by using our uh, anti-differentiation techniques. So let's go ahead and attack this. First of all, when we look at the Riemann sum in summation notation, we have to look at the clues it's giving us. The first thing is that this outside expression typically will be left, and we know that that is our delta x. So the first thing I could do is I could say, okay, my delta x, and let's get this down a little bit, my delta x is going to be, my delta x will be 3 over n. Now, the next thing I'm going to look for is my rule. Typically, we leave the problems nice and simple, and a lot of times you'll just see them un in unsimplified form, and you'll see this big bracket here, and we just have to look at what is that rule. Well, in this one, we should note that the whole bracket is the rule. So right in here, and if we just take things outside of the jupes um, and take them out of the jupes, we can see the rule. So if you notice, I have a bracket, then I have a 3, and then I have a nice jupe here with it looks like something might be my x sub i. So I'm going to write it like this. And it turns out I think my rule, or my f of x rule now, is going to be f of x is going to be 3 times my x and minus 8. And it looks like then I know what my x sub i is then. So if I look on the inside, I see, oh, OK, how about if I try x sub i is equal to 3i over n plus 2. I know that from when I build it, I know that I'm looking for that to be a plus uh, delta x times i. So let's see if I can find delta x in here. And if I look, I find delta x as my 3 over n. So there I have. I've, I've got my delta x. I've got my i. And so a must be 2. So what's left there, a is 2. So now I know since a is 2, I have a, another clue. a is, or sorry, a is 2. Uh, why did I say a is 2? Because it is 2, but I wrote 3. That wasn't too bright. But let's change that 3 to a 2. And what do we know here? What do we know about this 3 on top of this n? Well, that numerator represents b minus a. So I know that b minus a is equal to 3, but if I know a is 2, so b is equal to going to be 3 plus a, which would be 2 there, and then so I know b is 5. So now I've determined that b is 5. a is 2, b is 5, and I think my rule is 3x minus 8, so I'm pretty good to say that this represents the definite integral from 2 to 5 of my rule now, which is 3x minus 8. And my variable of integration then would be dx. And so that would be it. And that's all we would have to do. Now, to evaluate it, it would be a lot easier now to do it um, by anti-differentiating. So we'll have 3 halves x squared minus 8x minus 8x. And that will be evaluated between 2 and 5. OK, so if we go ahead and plug the numbers in, we would get an evaluation. And let's not worry about that right now. Let's jump to another example while we have some time here. OK, let's go ahead and jump to problem number 6 and see how we would do that one. OK, let's go and identify first. Let's look at our b minus a over n. So I know, uh, I know that my delta x gives me that clue. So my delta x is equal to 5 over n. And so my b minus a is going to be equal to 5. Then I could look at my rule. My rule looks to be um, a 5 times something cubed minus 1. So I'm going to suggest that f of x now is equal to 5 times something cubed minus 1. And that something will be my x independent variable. So what do I need now? I need to find maybe what what a is. So I'm looking on the inside of my jupe. There I have it, sitting there, right there. 
there it's sitting the negative 2 and I'm going to think that a is now negative 2 so let's just write here a is equal to negative 2 so if that's negative 2 so b minus a negative 2 how about if we put it on the other side so b is equal to so let's do our work here b is equal to a plus 5 and with the negative 2 plus 5 and that's just going to give us we substitute in that b is going to be let's see 3 3 so let's see negative 2 plus 5 is 3 I think we've got all the puzzle pieces put together now uh, let's see if this fits now I'm assuming my delta x is 5 over n so there is my my delta x i right there there it is it's okay I've got it there 5 i over n that is my delta x of i delta x times i and I'm ready to write my definite integral so this represents this limit to infinity of this Riemann sum it's now the definite integral from negative 2 to 3 and then that would be my rule would be 5x cubed minus 1 okay that's my rule then by my variable of integration and I've got that one written okay so now we've done that one so let's go ahead and do one more let's see we've got uh, more time for another one so I'm gonna come down here with this cosine this cosine one so let's make that go up higher and notice uh, I'm looking for my brackets to the rules so there's a bracket there and there's a bracket and it looks like here is a good candidate for my B minus A over N uh, so let's let's start dissecting it I think that uh, my B minus A over N which is equal to pi over 6 N we take the N away take the N away and what we're left with is that B minus A is going to be equal to pi over 6 so we've got that so far so now let's look at our x sub i now as I'm examining my x sub i I have uh, again what I want I've got my my delta x and I've got i notice I don't have any a so I'm looking for the form of a plus delta x i and since I don't have an a a must be 0 and then I will say then that this is plus then my uh, pi over 6n i that all fits so the key was that I was looking for a to be 0 I found a is 0 I'm good to go so since a is 0 b must be equal to let's write this a is 0 here if I identify that there's my a and so b must be pi over 6 so what this what this Riemann sum represents now is the definite integral from 0 to pi over 6 of the rule is the cosine rule so there's our cosine rule so it's cosine x and then dx and that's pi over 6 okay so that would be our definite integral there now when they're all bunched up when they're in simplified form sometimes they're a little difficult to look at so these are becoming they're, they're a little more challenging so what we really want to look for is we want to get something over n for our delta x and we want to factor that out on the outside so when I look at this I need an n so n in the denominator could also be written as the square root of n squared so I'm gonna go ahead and do some work here inside here and show it this way I think my first step is going to be to just write square root i over square root n and now I'm going to take and factor out a square root n squared and I'm just going to bring an n out here okay so I'm going to write it like that and then my next step is I'm looking for a number on top of n and I'm just going to put the number one here just so I could see a good uh, delta x so I think right now what I built is my delta x is going to be 1 over n so my b minus a is equal to 1 so next thing in my simplification I might go ahead and just write it this way if I write the square root as follows if I write it the square root of i times 1 over n 
I clearly can see there's my I there's my Delta X and then what I have then is my 1 over N on the outside and I think I'm all set my my rule looks to be a square root rule so I'm just gonna go ahead and now define that f of x is equal to the square root of x I found a a is 0 because there's no numeral next at that's added to this um, x sub i we found that earlier where a was 0 so I'm ready to write the definite integral now so it's gonna go from where excuse me a is 0 to b is 1 it's my square root function and then dx and I could use my anti-differentiation to do that and I could say two-thirds x to the three halves evaluated between 0 and 1 the 0 would drop out so then we could easily get a answer of two-thirds for that problem okay the last one we're gonna do we've got a few more minutes so we're gonna see what we can do on this one now remember we're trying to see what sum does this represent okay so I'm gonna go ahead and try to factor out if I can something that would make sense on this okay and the first thing I might look at is saying okay every time I do this I want to see what is what am I doing I'm looks like I'm looks like I'm squaring I's here so I think what I have on top is an I squared if I have an I squared, that must be my rule. So I'm going to start building this. So if I have to have an, a, an I times delta X, I think a good delta X might just be 1 over N. So if I have a 1 over N, I need that uh, to appear out of here. So I've got an N squared. I think what will be left over is a 1 over N on the outside of either all these terms. So if I write it like this, if I think that might be the sum, going from I1 to N. Let's see what that work out. I'm going to do when I is 1. It's 1 squared over N. So it's over N squared times N. All these denominators stay constant. So I see that this fits up. So this looks like that that's equal to the limit as N goes to infinity of the summation of my rule now. My rule is my uh, square rule and there's I over N here and then 1 over N on the outside and now I've got everything identified virtually and that's going to represent uh, a uh, B minus a is equal to 1 there is no a inside there so it's 0 so B is equal to 1 and then finally my rule would be f of X is equal to x squared because I'm squaring that so finally what I would have left over here is this would represent the definite integral going from 0 to 1 of x squared dx and notice that would be x cubed over 3 evaluated between 0 1 and that would then leave us with the final value the area under that curve would be 1 third so geometrically what we're looking at here is we have the x cubed curve coming in here and here's one so this area here is one-third okay so that's what we have we have a Riemann sum that now we've built the definite integral and in this case we had to unsimplify our Riemann sums for these two so try to look at this and get an understanding of how your expanded Riemann sum could be written and you'll have a clue of how to solve these problems. I hope this helped and good luck.